Today we're going to talk about health, wellness, and disability. My name is Lindsay Mullis and I'm the Health and Wellness Coordinator here at the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. My background is in psychology and exercise science as well as health promotion with a certificate in developmental disabilities. I'm funded through the Centers for Disease Control, which is pretty cool, um, and I also am a certified clinical director for the health promotion uh, program with a special Olympics Healthy Athletes. So a lot of great things have come along uh, the way for me to be able to do what I do, and this is definitely my dream job and a passion of mine, and I'm really excited to share with you all uh, why it should be something important to you as well. So my job is really to inspire and educate and motivate others to lead healthy lifestyles and I do that promoting it with individuals with disabilities as well as those that serve within the disability community. So this applies to you because you wouldn't be in this class if improving the quality of lives for those with disabilities wasn't important to you as well. And oftentimes health is an overlooked a factor that really plays into the quality of life for individuals that we're looking to serve. And you have the ability to make a difference and promote healthy lifestyles in whatever field it is that you're going into, whatever you're going to be when you grow up. Uh, the things that we're going to talk about today, I'm really hoping, are going to be resources and tools that you can use to really make you the best professional that you can be and really make a difference. This picture is from a program that I did in doing health promotion with individuals with intellectual disabilities and this was one of our last classes and I was saying to them that you're not going to be able to see me anymore and I want you to be successful in continuing on making these healthy choices so what are your barriers and I think this is really compelling that they came up with unsupportive people as the number one barrier for being able to be successful and continuing leading a healthy lifestyle because all of us, we're those people in their lives, and if we're not supportive of them, then we become their biggest barrier. I also think it's interesting, if you look at the bottom of that list, uh, that they said that ourselves, knowing and recognizing that we can be our own worst enemy sometimes, and that we can be so hard on ourselves that we really rely on the support people around us to be supportive, to make us successful. So in thinking about moving forward with what we're talking about today, really think about the role that you play um, in being able to identify those other barriers so that you can be a supportive person and look for those solutions to make positive changes, because that's so critical in the aspect of being successful. Also in moving forward and thinking about what it means to talk about health and wellness, I want you to think about this in a holistic sense. A lot of times people think about physical health as the main aspect, but really this holistic aspect includes social, environmental, emotional, uh, or intellectual, spiritual health, and all of those are so intertwined and interconnected. So to really make a true impact on quality of life and be truly healthy, we need to think about all of these aspects uh, and what that looks like um, in the bigger picture. One of my main projects that I support is the implementation of the Health Matters curriculum, which is an evidence-based exercise and uh, nutrition-based curriculum for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so uh, we support community-based organizations across the state to be able to implement this curriculum and work with individuals to have self-determined health goals and improve their self-efficacy so that they can be successful in making those healthy choices, as well as looking at the organizational culture and saying, seeing what we can do to um, provide those supports, making sure those healthy choices are made available, and making sure that the social supports are positive for individuals going through the programming. But instead of just me talking about it, it's a lot better to see uh, the program in action. So I'm going to show you a video of the pilot program we ran on campus, uh, which is really exciting because I actually ran it with no funding, went to the dollar store once, spent $20 uh, to see what it was like to be able to support those organizations that their first excuse for not wanting to incorporate health and wellness is because they have no funding. So let's check it out. Health Matters Program is an evidence-based exercise and nutrition health education curriculum for individuals with developmental disabilities, authored by a team of professionals at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Oh, I'm never gonna give it up, no. 
For 12 weeks, hours, three times a week, working on empowering participants to take charge of their health by learning what it means to be healthy and what healthy looks like and feels like to them so that they could in turn make healthier choices and therefore live happier, healthier lifestyles. I feel so much better about myself. And okay. exercise is really important. Eat things that are healthy for you and stay healthy every day that's what, and all that. You can tell your um, friends or family about it so that they support you and stuff. Lessons consisted of 30 to 60 minutes of educational classroom-like setting, followed by 45 to 60 minutes of physical activity where we incorporated the subject of a lesson into the exercises or with an active game. Learned. Mommy. Up. My, my favorite thing about the class was learning how to do healthier things for your body eating the right things and learning how to do more exercises. Having good friends and just to have fun. I eat the good stuff. Yes, I can do this. I anticipated the program to go well and be successful, but my expectations were entirely exceeded. What was most impressive was how much each participant accomplished. Collectively as a group, we lost 27.2 pounds over those three months and there were visible changes in the participants. They started drinking more water, being more active outside of class, and incorporating healthy food choices into their diets. So the reason that this really matters so much to incorporate health and wellness into what we're thinking about and supporting people with disabilities is because of the health disparities that are experienced by this population. And some of the, the higher rates in negative health conditions include the obvious ones like obesity, high cholesterol, and heart disease, stroke, um, diabetes, and depression, and decreased productivity and independence, which is already a barrier individuals with disabilities are facing, but then you add poor health, and that is going to be even worse for them. So let's start with the obvious being obesity. Now this is from the CDC back in 2010 so these numbers are outdated but even back then over 72 million adults in the United States were obese and they came in at over $1,400 uh, more for their health care expenditures than an individual who is not obese and as a country not one state had an obesity rate less than 15%, which was the goal for the nation at that time. So now let's take a look at the United States compared to the rest of the world when it comes to the percentages of overweight or obese citizens. Um, I think this slide speaks for itself to show the epidemic that we're experiencing when it comes to those obesity rates, not just in adult citizens, but also with our children. So if we break down the United States uh, by territory, you can see that where you live really does matter. So that brings into what we're thinking about is environment and those factors, maybe even those social factors. I mean, why is it more so that there's orange in the South? Perhaps maybe because we like butter and gravy, uh, right, on our food. Um, so thinking about how that's going to look different uh, and how that's going to affect the choices that we make uh, and looking at the obesity rates. Now this is back in 2011. So we'll see how this progresses.
So here we are in 2015, and a good majority of the nation is in the orange area of having 30 to 35 percent of their population being um, uh, considered obese. And then we've got some of the dark red, which is above 35 percent. And so as we can see, yes, there is an epidemic and it's spreading, but still there's those environmental factors that are playing into uh, what choices people are making and where we live makes a difference. One of those factors in obesity rates is the consumption of fruit and vegetables. And so this slide is talking about the CDC state indicator um, on fruit and vegetable consumption. And so you can see there again across the nation uh, that it's different within different territories. And so you've got how many uh, vegetables are being uh, eaten among the United States in one day. And it's interesting to me that even the dark green, so the states that are supposed to be doing well, are still... Uh, eating less than two uh, servings of vegetables a day. But if we look at Kentucky specifically, uh, for fruits, it's saying that half of our population eats less than one fruit a day. And then um, there's about a quarter of our population in our state uh, that's eating less than uh, one vegetable a day. So really compelling evidence for um, thinking about our health and what we're putting into our bodies. So now that we've looked at obesity rates uh, across the country, we're going to add looking at through the lens of disability. So if we think about obesity rates for adults with disabilities are approximately 57% higher than for those without disabilities, and that was back in 2008, so we know that number's got to be even higher today. That means for every one person without a disability that was considered obese, there were 57 individuals with disabilities that were also considered obese. So when it comes to disability in the state of Kentucky, you can see here from the CDC information that um, almost a third of our population classifies as having a disability. And when we talk about health care expenditures specifically for the state, now this is in 2015, that's $5.8 billion per year in the state of Kentucky that are um, monies that are dedicated to health care expenditures related to disability. So if we're looking at what adults with disabilities are more likely to, down below, um, I created, I'm a visual person, so I created um, a slide that's going to be a little bit more easier to see the differences between um, individuals with disabilities and those without within our state for those health factors. So here we have that Kentucky data and looking at individuals with disabilities versus those without in our state. And as you can see across the board, individuals with disabilities are at a more severe health disparity when it comes to everything from uh, the incidence rate of smoking cigarettes, being obese, having high blood pressure, or heart disease, being able to be physically active, or even um, relaying to uh, their self-related health as fair or poor, which if you look at the numbers, you know, 11 to 53.6, I think that that is absolutely heartbreaking to know that there's that big of a difference that individuals with disabilities are able to relay on a self-reported survey that they have fair or poor health, which really shows that there's a call to action within this area. Now we're looking at uh, Kentuckians with intellectual disabilities based on the National Core Indicator data. So what we're looking at here is that individuals with the cognitive impairments um, and how they relate to their physical activity and their body mass index for obesity rates. And as you can see, Kentucky in blue compared to the national average in orange, we don't have big numbers to live up to anyways. But even then, we're still falling short when it comes to engaging in regular physical activity only 30 minutes a day three times a week, which doesn't even meet the recommended guidelines uh, for maintaining regular health. And then again, looking at normal weight versus being overweight and obese, um, our, our numbers are just really underwhelming and definitely showing that there's a, a need for focusing on this population. The information on this slide is a real so the problem is, is that when health promotion programming came about however many decades ago and was focused on when funding, people thought that individuals specifically with intellectual disabilities could not benefit from programming. So in looking at what the truths are versus the myths, here's what a lot of misconceptions are. People with IDD are sick, which in truth, that's not true. They can see themselves as healthy and be healthy. One of the myths is that people with disabilities are overweight or obese just because they have a disability. They're identified as um, having a disability and just a poor weight, an unhealthy weight, is a secondary condition to that, when in reality, individuals with disabilities can obviously have a healthy weight. 
Another big misconception is that those chronic conditions that we talked about are disability related. So again, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, all secondary to that disability, when in reality, those chronic conditions are lifestyle related. So individuals who are sedentary, which means they're not very active, or there's poor nutrition, or even lack of opportunity for healthy choices, those are going to be the factors that really affect that, not just because someone has a disability. And again, there's this misconception that these lifestyle changes are impossible with this population. Population, but that's not true. Uh, the research goes to show that health promotion strategies work and they work well. And so what is really interesting about this is that looking at all these health factors that we've talked about, research is showing that it's only 30% genetics and it's 70% choices and behaviors, which is where we really need to strive to support the individuals that we're looking to work with to be able to make those positive choices because that's 70% of their outcome. To showcase how well these health promotion strategies are working, this next video is actually my favorite video um, from one of our self-advocates as well as a community uh, program staff member who implemented that Health Matters program at their rural organization within Somerset, Kentucky, really showcasing uh, the positive benefits that they got out of programming. Hello, this is James Stephen Love, and this is my poem, The Way I Used to Be. I used to be as big as a tree, just like my whole family. They would fill themselves with cakes and pies, and never want to exercise. When I wanted to lose weight, they called me names and filled me with hate. You're not going to lose weight, you idiot. You're going to be fat like us, you twit. But that drove me to work hard. I pushed myself from the start. I worked hard, fast, and quick. I was losing weight by the look of it. Now they look at me with pain at the falsehood of what they say. You can do what you envision. You just need will and good motivation. When we started the program, Stephen, he wasn't that interested in joining the program. And, but later he saw what was going on and he asked me, can you start anew because the other groups were full. So because Stephen asked me, I started another group. And there was five of us in that group. It was a little bit smaller, but we proceeded with the program with just extra because they wanted to. So I think if you do it, you'll find that somebody may be not as receptive in the beginning, but they'll see how much fun everybody else is having and they'll want to join in. As we moved on, everybody seemed to enjoy the program. They enjoyed the classes that we taught, which was a wonderful book that gave you step by step on how to do it, which helped us immensely. We didn't have to figure it out. It was all done for us. It was just awesome to see. They would compare their foods, what they had for lunch, um, read their labels. Hey, they'd ask staff, hey, does this too much calories for me to eat today? Which is something that had never happened before. And they, they were even telling their home providers, I can't eat this, which was kind of a neat thing to see. Like, I've also found alternatives like peanuts for my salty chip addiction and these, granola bars. This stuff right here, I think, let me look at the calorie intake. Sorry, I know, I know I should have brought enough to share. But the point is finding alternatives to things like, like I, I never thought I'd like granola. But I found some peanut butter chocolate, peanut butter chocolate granola that like, one, one serving is one third of, of a Reese cup. And it tastes just the same, just a little harder. I, this is where I'm going to get harsh, but this is just how it is. No one's going... There's no, there's no fairy godmother going to magically make you skinny. God knows it never helped me. No one's going to fix you personally unless you get off your sorry behind, quit watching internet videos on how to exercise, and just exercise. I remember the garden was always fun. I used to love watching the people plant. One of the things that we did do that everybody had fun with, and this could include the whole building no matter your uh, ability, is we did a garden and everybody got a chance to plant something. We got to reap what we sowed. We made salsa from it. Um, they had tomatoes that we cooked one day with tomatoes. It was just, it was fun to watch them grow as long, along with the garden. My favorite thing to do was always my bike. I love biking. I loved going fast, even though it was a, technically a big, a big trike, but I'm not complaining. It's, I, it was mine and I didn't have to pay for it. Nothing beats free in this world. I think my favorite program was one thing I did things that were out of the box. There's a lot of things that you can think about that you're doing exercise but it's fun. For example, we bought a, a um, parachute 
and you get a lot of upper body doing that parachute. And even people in wheelchairs can do the parachute. They just use their hands and they don't have to worry about if they're in a wheelchair or they're sitting with a cane or walker. They sit in a chair and they have a ball. Staff has fun too because we put the balls on top and we bounce them. And they're exhausted when they're done doing this because it's so much fun. I think having both clients and staff be involved is better because you learn by example. And by having everybody doing it together, they fed off of each other. And staff are supposed to be good examples anyway, but this made it even more fun because they were competing. It just it made the atmosphere so much better. A total of 84 pounds in the last 11 months. You don't got to give up your food. You just got to downsize a little and you just got to work a little harder. If you don't have to quit the junk food cold turkey, God knows if that were true, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. Our program has changed everybody's thought process. Even after we finished the program for Health Matters, we still continued it. It's on a daily basis. We have a Health Matters class. You have an eight hour day to fill. And in that eight hours, you've got at least an hour that you could give to Health Matters. It was a wonderful program that we, that we tried and we enjoyed. I was very skeptical in the beginning, but I would say at least give it a try. If you want to be healthier or happier, that, all the power to you. That's, that's, that all ties in because that's why I'm saying being comfortable in your own skin. You've got to be comfortable in your own skin in order to survive. So if you want to be healthier or happier, all the power to you. I actually, I actually give you enough golfer applause right now. I'm sure you can see why that is my favorite video because Steven is such an incredible self-advocate and such a great motivator for uh, leading a healthy lifestyle whether you have a disability or not. Uh, so um, hope you guys enjoyed that video as well. Um, this slide we're talking about where the CDC actually launched a campaign specifically on disability and health uh, back in 2014. So I've got the website on there for you because it's such a great resource. There's all kinds of information and um, handouts and things that are specific to health and disabilities, but also really awesome is this disability and health data system. So a lot of those slides and the information that I was able to pull from that with the data came from this system. And so if you're looking to learn more about uh, disability and health and you want to look between states or between disabilities, uh, all that information is there and they are continuing to keep it updated. And so if you're thinking to write a paper or you want to incorporate this kind of information into your dissertation, what a great resource for you guys. So definitely um, make sure you write this down and have it because it's a wonderful resource to be able to have that information. Also included on the disability and health aspect from the CDC, they talk about those barriers that individuals with disabilities face when it comes to being able to lead healthy lifestyles. So in looking at those, you know, the lack of healthy food options, just not having those available, difficulty chewing or swallowing could be, you know, an, an issue. Medications really have a huge effect on weight gain or appetite uh, or even heart rate. So having those kinds of considerations for looking at making those healthy choices Places. obviously physical limitations and pain. Lack of energy. I like to think that all of us can use the excuse of lack of energy being the reason why we don't make it to the gym one day, right? Um, and then again, the accessibility to those resources. And really, all the time, money, transportation, again, having proper social support to feel encouraged or successful. I think we can all relate to those kinds of barriers for why maybe we're not successful ourselves in making those healthy choices. The CDC obviously also gives us what we can do to be healthy. These are things that hopefully you already know to incorporate into your, your own lifestyle about eating more fruits and vegetables, avoiding the fatty and sugary foods, right, like the fast food, drinking more water, avoiding those soft drinks, watching less television so that we can be more physically active. But then another one that is often overlooked is promoting policy and programming that offers those healthy choices. So depending on where you are in your field and where you're wanting to go, that might really be something that you can focus on in being able to be an advocate, to be someone who helps with the writing of the policies, the procedures, so that those healthy options are made available to the individuals that we're looking to serve and that can obviously, hopefully as you've seen by now, really benefit from the focus on that. So obviously making these positive changes and making these healthy choices are going to have those positive outcomes, right? So our research demonstrates that having that healthy diet and exercise, all those things we talked about previously, improve quality of life on that holistic 
idea of health. And so some examples that um, that have been given from that research include the decreased risk of developing all those negative health conditions I've already been talking about, having a healthy weight, and believe it or not, you have more energy. I know, you go to the gym thinking that, oh, I'm going to be tired afterwards, you're actually going to have more energy. You drink more water and eat fruits and vegetables, you're going to feel better, which is great. Uh, now, when it comes to less constipation or diarrhea, that's a really important factor for our individuals with disabilities. Uh, if you think about uh, side effects of the medication or maybe chair users who uh, aren't as active, you know, that's really something that can be impactful to not only their quality of life, but um, bowel obstruction is unfortunately a big cause of death for people with disabilities. So being able to focus on um, making these healthy lifestyle choices and affecting those in a positive way um, can even save somebody's life, uh, which is incredible. And then decreasing pain and daily activity, as well as increased strength and independence, which we know in supporting individuals with disabilities, that's a really important factor. And then feeling happier and fighting off depression. I always say that, uh, you know, being healthy brings on the happy hormones, right? Uh, so that's a good thing. And then just increasing confidence to perform exercise and make those healthy choices, like I talked about earlier, improving that self-efficacy piece. And that can actually relay over into other aspects um, of an individual's life, whether it be employment um, or, you know, or making friends, those kinds of things. Um, and there's just this positive change in attitudes that really enhances life satisfaction. And so, when looking at that, we're looking at uh, the positive ways that are reducing barriers to exercises and making those healthy lifestyle choices. And we all have the power to stimulate all of these positive changes and more just by including uh, education and health promotion programming and what we're doing and, and trying to make sure it's something that we're cognizant of. Actually, the very first time I gave this presentation to the HCI certificate course, there was a student in the course who had a daughter with a disability, and she asked a lot of questions about ways to incorporate these kinds of things into her daughter's lifestyle, and one of the main ones was drinking more water, because her daughter refused to drink anything that was not uh, sugary or colored, uh, and so she never drank water, and she had some real issues with bowel obstruction and uh, the constipation and even dehydration and so I gave her some resources with um, obviously the crystal lights real popular um, but the Lameo drops because they also have vitamins and minerals in them um, and then also uh, just water infuser I like to put in the summer strawberries or blueberries in water or even mint um, and so that's still drinking water but you're getting an, a neat flavor with that and a couple weeks later after I taught the class she came into my office with tears in her eyes and hugged me and thanked me so much for the positive improvement she'd seen in her daughter just in that short amount of time from being able to get her to drink more water or implement some of these strategies that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. So the positive changes are, are boundless and the, even the smallest thing can make a positive impact. What's also nice about focusing on health promotion are these additional benefits that uh, are above and beyond programming then are also above and beyond health benefits because if you look at programs that offer health promotion they're going to lower insurance costs of staff um, or even individuals there's going to be fewer visits to the emergency room or doctor's office fewer insured or hospital stays and just increased productivity and that's across the board so in in trying to convince these organizations and community um, programs to incorporate health, you know, again, there's always this concern of lack of funding. So this is another argument to say, yeah, but if you, you focus on health, you're going to get all these health benefits and look at all these economical benefits that are going to come uh, as well, which is a great way to kind of argue your point about how important it is. So I realize at this point that I've been talking about health promotion and some of you may not necessarily know what that is. So there is a difference between health promotion versus health education. And really the difference there is that health promotion is looking at that bigger, broader spectrum, the educational part, that political, the environmental, regulatory, so the policy and programming, all those organizational mechanisms. So looking at health promotion is how can we 
talk about health and educate it individuals and we want to just make changes on this bigger scale uh, versus where health education differs because it's more those planned opportunities for learning experiences, the, the lesson plans. It's based on theories, focus on individuals and information, the motivation behind it and the skills. And health education is an obvious important part of health promotion, but you really want to look at the, the process of enabling people to make them successful at making those healthy choices so those positive outcomes can be reached.